Ever since he could read and walk, this kid loved manhwa, but every time he read one, he felt like the main character was super lame. What was really cool to him was to look carefree, but possess incredible strength. This is the kind of power he yearned for, and as time passed, he became efficient at helping others without being noticed. Even when out in the open, he swiftly hid when he sensed something, and people thought that perhaps a benevolent spirit was helping them. After he was done with the granny, he thought of who to help next, perhaps the uncle at the fruit stand. But just as he was walking away, he got hit by a truck and died. He suddenly awakes in a strange place, sweat dropping like bullets from him, as he still feels the sensation of being hit. A woman appears and says that this is the world of magic and mighty heroes. She has been waiting for someone like him, for one with such a pure soul. She introduces herself as the goddess of this world, Hersia, and she's looking to revive him. The boy asks if she really knows who he is already, which she confirms, as he is one of the few people in the world who helped others without being noticed for so long. Many gods are in awe of his deeds. Instead of being happy, the boy is sad, as he worked hard to be unnoticed, but it seems that he cannot hide from the gaze of the gods. Hersia starts laughing, as he is far too amusing, but since it has come to this, she will give him a blessing. He can become anything he wants in this world, the demon king, a hero, a dragon, or perhaps even the king of hell. It is his choice. What does he want to become? The boy instantly says that he wants to become a character that hides his strength, as he was always lacking in his original world. Yes, he fanned people secretly and cleaned the street without anyone noticing, but that's not what he truly wants. That's light work. A real hidden power is ignored normally, but shows overwhelming strength when prompted. Hersia finally gets it. He wants overpowering strength and also wants to hit it and be ignored altogether. She notes that he will be reborn as a commoner of this world, but his strength shall be greater than any hero, demon king, or dragon. Additionally, the moment his strength is revealed, his heart will burst inside of his chest. It will become as he wished, someone who needs to hide their strength. The boy tries to say something about this, but Hersia doesn't let him and says that he must walk a lonely road because of this condition, but she prays that he achieves the peace he yearns for so much. After that two entire years pass, and the boy still can't believe that a god is such a bad listener, but it's alright, as he is still the strongest around here. He easily takes care of a bunch of giant wolves, which makes the last one bolt out of the area, as he doesn't want to meet the same fate. The boy is surprised that it managed to get that far, but even if he shows his strength to the beasts, his heart will not explode, so he easily takes care of it and thinks of going back to the village sooner. He has become Urien, a nine-year-old. When he does go back, another one of the orphans asks where he has gone without telling anyone. Urien apologizes, as his stomach hurts so he had to take care of it, but the girl tells him that he should tell her at least, as he is weak, so he should not wander alone. Urien apologizes but secretly enjoys it. The other orphans say that there aren't many wolf packs near them anymore, which is great. As people can farm better now, surely it must be thanks to the priest's prayers. Urien is glad to see that he helps some people indirectly, but he can't cherish this happiness for long, as their caretaker comes and grabs his head, calling him trash before throwing him away. He graciously accepted him since he was so young, but look at how short and weak he is. Is he useful for anything? The red-haired girl asks if he's alright, but Urien just smiles while apologizing, as he was not caught today. The caretaker sees the others standing around and tells them to get back to work, which they do. But he also notes that they better have learned that song, the ones who can't sing it, shall become food to the wolves. They all go to the center of the village and start singing a song about how the caretaker is the best man in the village, and they are happy because he gives them food. They are surely doing this out of their own volition to give back to everyone. Somehow, the people don't see anything suspicious, and cheer the kids on, and even the caretaker, for taking them in when they had nowhere else to go. One of them even gives them an entire chicken, which the kids are excited for. But when dinner time comes, the caretaker is enjoying a meal fit for a king, while the kids get a bunch of boiled potatoes. The younger girl notes that the auntie gave them the chicken. Why are they only getting potatoes? The boy next to her tells her to eat it in silence. It is better to have a belly full of potatoes than to starve in the cold. Urien also damns the caretaker for being so awful, but the red-haired girl tells them to cheer up, as she has something special for them. Their faces light up when they see the eggs, and the girl notes that she secretly got them when they were helping out in the center. They should eat them quickly, to not be found out. She also offers Urien her egg, as he is too skinny, and if he gets too skinny, he will be thrown away. Urien says that it's fine, she should enjoy the fruits of her loins with them. She tries to force him to eat it, but she stops when her stomach suddenly grumbles. She tries to excuse herself, but Urien says that it's fine. She should be the one who eats the egg. Urien remembers that when he first came into this world, he was an orphan, and nobody wanted him. It was hell. 
where others were violent towards him for no reason. Even if he did want everyone to look down on him, this was far too much. That's when Ella found him and told her to come to the orphanage. The caretaker is awful, but there is food and bed at least. Her stomach grumbled then too. She presented him to the caretaker and begged him to let him stay, as he should be good at working since he is a boy. She can guarantee it. Yurian still can't believe how nice she is, and after putting the egg in her mouth, he notes that they should go to the Magic Academy. They can both attend the Academy, where there is tasty food, and they can eat however much they want. The other kids want in too, and Ella says that they will all go together and eat the tastiest food ever. Instead of trying to study and work hard here, they should focus on survival and leave together. The next day, the caretaker calls everyone, as he has some great news. Ella has been adopted today, so they should all feel happy for her. Ella apologizes for not being able to stay with them until the very end, but the two kids are happy for her, even though they might be sad in reality. The caretaker is not done with the good news yet, as Yurian has been selected to become the sacrifice for the wolf god. It is an honor bestowed by the gods. Ella tries to stop him, as he promised her before that he would take care of Yurian if she were to get adopted. The caretaker asks if he knows why the wolf packs aren't appearing so often these days, which Yurian confirms, as he really does. But the caretaker notes that everything he knows is wrong. The reason they do not appear so much is because they give them food on the regular, as they like young meat. He is weak and short. Even if he grows, he won't become much better than this. He will sacrifice himself to the village. He will be congratulated by everyone. Ella suggests that she become the sacrifice, so that Yurian can be spared. But as soon as she is done, a punch flies at her face, only stopping after the caretaker remembers the merchandise shouldn't be damaged, but she should not utter those words again, as he will really hurt her. Now that everything is settled, the others should get their brooms and start working. While waiting to be sacrificed, Yurian wonders what to do. Wait for this wolf god and deal with him before getting out of here secretly. But where would he go? Suddenly Ella calls his name, who cuts her hair and is nicely dressed. Yurian asks what happened and she says that she cut it in a way for it to be just like his. Since there is not much time, they should hurry and swap clothes already. Even though these are girly clothes, they should fit him nicely. Yurian doesn't get what is going on. Why would they change clothes? What does she want? Ella explains that she will become the sacrifice in his stead. Yurian is shook and asks if she even knows what that word means. Being sacrificed is not child's play. Ella knows already, as her younger brother was the sacrifice before. When she first stumbled upon him, she thought that he was her younger brother, who came back to her. They are both very similar. That's probably why she took so much care of him. She doesn't want to see another younger brother of hers die. So he should run as far away as he can from here. Yurian cannot believe these words are coming from a child, and suggests that they run away together. Why is she so fixated on being the sacrifice? Ella notes that they will be caught too quickly if they do that. He knows how fast the caretaker can be with some things. They can also wait for him to come, and when he sees what she did to her hair, he will start beating her. Since he forgets about time when it comes to beatings, he can slip out and leave the village. What she is asking of him is to live in her stead. The place she is getting adopted in is not a good place anyway. So rather than living like that, she would rather let him live. Yurian knows that these words aren't supposed to come from a ten-year-old. But even with his power, he cannot do anything. Suddenly the caretaker appears with a knife and asks what happened to her hair. Before she can say anything, the caretaker rushes to her and grabs her neck tightly. She is important merchandise. Yet she dares to mutilate herself like this? Her value has dropped significantly. Yurian activates his power to rescue her. But the moment he does that, a sharp pain overcomes his heart. Because of what that goddess said, his heart will rupture if he reveals his abilities. The caretaker grips even tighter, and when he sees her hairband, he finally understands what she wants. To die as a sacrifice, right? This can only make him laugh, as he wants to reveal something to her. The wolf god is actually him. He is the one who killed her younger brother. After giving the skin and meat to the monsters, he sold the organs for a good price. He couldn't believe how much money they were worth even when dead. It's an honor for them to serve him in such a way. If she would like to know, her brother was a kind lad until the end, saying that it's good he was a sacrifice because he couldn't work well. The caretaker continues laughing until he notices that Ella isn't breathing anymore, but that's when he notices something else. Yurian standing right beside him. He notes that his precious elder sister is dead. The Ella who was always worried about him. He shouldn't worry, however, as he will send him to her side soon enough. Yurian remembers all that she has done for him, and wonders why he was hesitating all of this time. He remembers the talk he had with Hersia, who asked why he wanted to become a hidden, overpowering character. Wouldn't it be more straightforward to become the Demon King, or the Hero? He explained that the Hero, and the Demon King, use their powers either for humanity, or for demons. He doesn't want that. He wants to use his power for the people he wishes to save. Before he can do anything, 
The caretaker's head is completely eradicated, and the building that was once sheltering them from the sun is annihilated, revealing the aftermath of that punch. Yurian grabs Ella before she could fall and apologizes sincerely for being so late, but that's when she coughs, revealing that she is still alive, although barely. Yurian swiftly uses heal on her, completely making any injury disappear. He is truly glad that he was able to save her, but this is his end. Even if his life here was short, he has no regrets. A large thump bellows the area, but it was from the caretaker's body, as Yurian is still alive. Why? Because if he kills someone before they notice his power, he will not die. Thanks to the goddess Hershia, he entered a whole new world, and managed to save a person he cherishes from a monster. It has been four years since then. As Yurian prepares to face another monster, he remembers that he forgot to drink his milk this morning. How will he ever grow any taller than this if he keeps forgetting? The beast swiftly attacks him as he tries to remember what the normal height of a 13-year-old is, and he swiftly takes care of it, before it can do anything else. He notices that the beast's head is made of bone, so he wonders if eating bone will make him stronger. As always, he is still the strongest. Later that day, at a church, someone tells Ella and Yurin that they are old enough to take the entrance exam. Did they prepare well? This is Sister Arlen, who took them in after the caretaker died under mysterious circumstances. They both say that they are perfectly prepared, with the other two kids also cheering them on. Sister Arlen notes that the Lord must have a reason for taking the director and leaving them alive. She only hopes that the blessing of the Lord stays with them for the magic school entrance exam. The magic school is the place they dreamed of going since they were in that awful orphanage, but it's also a perfect place for someone like him. The past four years were extremely boring because all he did was secretly slay monsters. Now though, people will completely disregard him out in the open. Isn't that what a magic school in a fantasy world is about? A main character who is looked down upon. He is truly blessed to be here. The Royal School of Magic was founded by the royal family, and it fosters talented individuals, regardless of status, in order to defend people from monsters. Today is the day of the entrance exam. A noble by the name of Chris notices how dignified everything is in this academy, including the gate itself. He looks around and notices that most people have blue brooches, meaning that they are nobility just like he is. But he also notices a red brooch, meaning that the girl in front of him is the princess of the royal family. This year's entrance exam will certainly be entertaining, if nothing else. He suddenly hears some commotion, and when he looks to see what it is, he sees Ella and Yurian, who are both black brooches. He goes up to them and starts laughing. Even if their status is not looked at in this place, how can measly creatures like them dream of entering the school of magic? How foolish. Some other bastards start picking on them too, as they have no place here. But Chris tells them that they are going to get eliminated in the first few tests anyways. They should give it a shot at least, so they can laugh at something. Yurian is very glad that he is getting bullied, as this is the true flow of a hidden strength character. But Ella suddenly turns around and tells Yurian to not listen to these bastards, because they value status more than any life. Yurian does follow her, but he believes that it was a shame he couldn't get to experience more of this. A few moments afterwards, the 29th entrance exam starts, and the head of the school of magic, Majes, tells everyone all about it. As students of this school, their goal is to protect the people with blades and magic. So for this entrance exam, their fundamentals on both of these areas will be tested. The others whisper about Yurian being a black brooch, which he really enjoys, but they don't seem to get that. Eventually, the instructor for the sword skill exam, Ga Ryunbi, introduces himself and explains that for this exam, all they have to do is slash the target that's behind him with all of their might. The kids are shocked to see that he managed to cut the dummy with only a piece of paper, but Ryunbi pays them no mind and notes that he will call them when it's their turn. First up is Tien, and he tells her to start when she is ready. Before doing that, she asks if she will get disqualified if she cannot slash all of it, but he tells her to not think about it. They have no expectations for them because they are kids, so they shouldn't try to do something flashy and instead do all that they can. With that, Tien tries her best, only resulting in her cutting a quarter of the dummy. The list moves on and on with most of them cutting the dummy in half, but they eventually get to Ella. Before she leaves, Yurian tells her that the criteria for this test is if they can cut half of it, she can easily do something like that. Ella thanks him for the encouragement and prepares to strike. The blue brooch nobles are already laughing, expecting her to drop the sword or something, but Ella pays them no mind and remembers how she failed to protect Yurian. This gives her enough strength to cut the dummy completely, something which surprises everyone, even more so since she is a black brooch. Ella is happy, because now she can protect Yurian. Ryunbi is the most surprised, as a magic wand was placed in the center of the target. Even if the kids struck it with everything, they couldn't have gone through it all. In order to cut it, she would need to fortify her weapon with magic, but doing so is hard, even for adults. 
However, this girl did it without even knowing. She is truly talented. The last person to take the test is Yurian, making Ryunbi wonder what he will be like. Yurian takes his shot and cuts a quarter of it, making the others laugh at him. But this is what he wanted. Being unnoticed is truly the best. Up next they have the magic test, and Ji introduces herself to the kids as the person in charge. On this test, they will use this magical tool and hit the target with magic. One of the kids says that he cannot use any magic, but she says that it's totally fine, as this magical tool can form their mana, even if they can't control it yet. The first one to go is Chris, who blasts quite a lot of water on the target, making the others praise him for his achievements, so he walks away smugly. Up next is Yurian, who tries to receive his wand from Chris, but he drops it on purpose and asks how he dares to try and receive something from a noble. Peasants are supposed to bow. Ella is shocked, and Ji tells them to not fight, but Yurian says that everything is alright, while walking away with a creepy smile. Thanks to this action, everyone is looking at him, so he will fail just like he planned and become the perfect hidden character. He attempts to control his mana, but a typhoon suddenly bursts out of the wand, shocking everyone watching. What's more shocking is that the wand broke entirely, leaving Yurian to think of how to fix this. The others also see that the wand is broken, and Yurian doesn't know how to get out of this. But that's when Chris screams that the magic too was faulty from the start. There is no way a peasant like him could destroy a magic tool. The other nobles are inclined to agree, since this would certainly damage their reputation. So they all agree that what Chris said is true. Yurian can't thank him enough for saving his life, but it is true that this magic tool is far too weak. He only used a bit of power yet it blew up. He just set up his status as the hidden carefree but powerful character. He cannot be caught now. Magus announces that the final test is upon them, and in it a team of three will go into the forest, where they will hunt a bear and bring one of its molars back. No matter how great their swordsmanship or mana is, if they cannot use it to fight, it is useless. Now is the time to prove themselves. Yurian is surprised by the conditions of this test, but Ella notes that they are on the home stretch of their dream, so they should use everything they've got and pass. Yurian agrees, and Magus notes that they will be revealing the teams now. People who emit the same light from their brooches are in the same team. Ella's brooch bursts in a bright red, and she is in the same team with a noble and the princess herself. Chris can't believe that a commoner is in the same team as royalty, but Yurian is very happy to see her at least be safe as those kids must be strong. He sends her off with a smile, but wonders why he isn't getting any light. It's good that he's being ignored, but will he really have no team? Suddenly someone calls him from behind, and notes that he's in the same team as them. He must be Yurian. He has been watching him while he was doing the tests. He introduces himself as Rishal, and says that they should try their best. Tien also introduces herself, and Yurian greets them, glad to see that he has a team. A team of nobles looks at them, and notices that there's a team with green and black brooches. How unsightly. They also recognize Rishal, as this is his fourth time taking this test, and the girl next to him is an abandoned noblewoman, who is good for nothing, a team full of rejects. Yurian just looks as the stuck-up nobles look down on them, but in this type of situation, he thrives, so he confidently notes that they just have to pass. This surprises his team, but Rishal smiles and his face lights up. He knew that there was something special about him. He does not flinch in front of these nobles. Even a commoner like him will get excited. He really has to get admitted into the academy, so they should all work together. Tian wonders if they can even pass, as she flunked both swordsmanship and magic tests. Yurian repeats her words, and finally gets that those were tests. This means that he flunked them too, so he won't be able to keep his promise to Ella. Rishal gives them a ray of hope, as he possesses more knowledge in this case, since he did the same things four times in a row. They can flunk the first two tests, because the monster test gives the highest points possible. So if they can nail this one, they are safe. Yurian is very happy to hear this, while Tien wonders why he's acting like he did something cool. Unfortunately for them, even with their spirits riled up, when they get to the forest, they can't do much of anything against such a large opponent. They eventually lose the bear, and Yurian thinks that they have to hunt at least one, but with these two, he cannot do anything. Now he realizes that being alone was the play here. How unfortunate. Rishal knows too that they will fail at this rate, and they all have their circumstances, he's sure. But he cannot fail this year, as it's the last one for him. Because of this, they should just get the bear's molar. The description of this test is to hunt a monster and bring its molars. Although they cannot hunt it, they should be able to get at least one of its morals. Yurian asks how they can do that, and Rishal explains that there is a way. These bears always have their molars out of their mouth, like some sort of tusks. So if they listen carefully, they can kill it. They are all lucky, because bear monsters are the easiest to hunt. All that must be done is for Tien to lather herself up in this. She rightfully asks what it is, and he notes that it's just deer blood, 
Bear monsters are very sensitive when it comes to smell, so when it becomes enraged because of the smell, they will get one of the molars. Tian doesn't quite get it, and says that she's not a great runner, but Rishal tells her that it's fine, they just need to break one, and when a bear monster is eating, it will ignore even the deadliest of attacks. Before he can open the flask, Yurian stops him, and asks if he's really telling her to die right in her face. Rishal does not get what is so wrong. Does he not want to go to school with his precious sister? Sometimes sacrifices are necessary. Does he perhaps have any other method of catching the beast? He already knows the answer. It's no. They are both weak commoners with no training. Unlike the nobles, they have no mana. That is why their only strength is their numbers. Two people passing by sacrificing someone is a huge deal, and this noblewoman is abandoned anyway. Nobody will miss her even if she dies. Tian remembers when a maid ridiculed her for failing the test again, while her elder brother, Ricky, is already amazing at everything. She really is a plague on this prestigious family. She is so downtrodden to the point where she kind of agrees with Rishal, but Yurian refuses. Whether abandoned or ignored, there will be a time for everyone to shine. He can't just decide someone else's worth just because of something out of their control. Rishal becomes fed up with him and lathers them both in blood so that they can die together. Almost instantly, the bear charges in, ready for a feast, leaving Tien horrified, but Yurian just smiles, as this is the perfect moment for him. Tien swiftly regains her composure and looks at Yurian, who is too weak to even run away, so she must be the one to kill the monster in front of them no matter what. However, the moment she sees the gaping maw of the bear, despair befalls her mind once again, and she feels that all hope is lost. That's when she remembers what the maid told her, that she's an embarrassment to the entire family, and gains the confidence to put up a windshield. She will prove now that she is also nobility. She summons a bunch of wind swords that rush towards the bear, but even if she's confident, that doesn't help much in terms of power, so the bear is unharmed. Even if she cannot do anything against the bear, she should at least get him out of here. Suddenly Yurian becomes surrounded by cool wind, and Tian says that the landing might hurt, since she only learned how to make things fly, not land, but she assures him that it's much better than dying like this. With one wand swipe, he is sent flying. Tien did this because his words gave her the courage to be brave and show herself that she is not as worthless as everyone thinks she is. The bear attempts to strike its open opponent, but that's when another strike from behind takes Tien out and Yurian takes her away from the beast. He is kind of glad that the glasses dude ran away because he managed to save this child because of it. The bear does not realize the situation he is in and only sees another harmless child, ready for eating. But with one strike, Yurian blasts a hole in his body and notes that he should prepare his trick before that guy comes back. Somewhere not so far away, Rishal and other commoners draw their blades against Ella and her group, with Ricky noting that their weapons should only be drawn at monsters. One of the commoners beckons Ella to their side, as she is also a commoner. She belongs with them, and will certainly pass the exam if she comes. Ricky asks what gives them the right to decide who and who doesn't pass this exam, and the commoner notes that they will make all of the nobles fail and pass like that. Ricky asks if they all banded together just for this, which enrages the commoner leader, as it's because of them that they had to resort to this. He will only say this one more time. The girl better come here or she will be considered an enemy. Ricky wonders if they really think they can win just because she is on their side, but the commoner leader says that it's not them who will defeat them. The monsters of the forest shall do it for them, as they are using them to kill all of the nobles. The others wonder why they chose such a talkative leader, and Ricky foresaw something like this since he saw the number of commoner participants rise quite significantly. The princess notes that such information is not that easy to get a hold of, but as a member of the royal family, she is disheartened to see them like this. They are the future protectors of the citizens, the students of the magic academy, yet they are using magic to meet their evil plans. She commands Ricky to capture them alive, as they will find the one who came up with this plan to use blood, and they will be investigated by the royal family for their crimes. With one swift strike, Ricky cuts down three examinees, knocking them out instantly. Seeing this, Rishal tells everyone to splash the blood around him, which they do, but it stops before touching him, and dries out slowly. The princess orders them to surrender, as their plans have been foiled. All the while, Ella is amazed to see their powers. She doesn't have to do anything. Rishal becomes extremely desperate, and says that this year is his only chance. He won't get another one ever, and if they don't do anything now, they will never be able to achieve their dreams. He refuses to give up and beckons his commoner brothers to not give up either, and do the same as him. They all cut their hands in unison, making the princess truly pity them. As a result of their actions, four bears show up, making Ella's mind turn hazy. They cannot hope to stand a chance against them. With one single word, that being wind, Ricky cuts off the heads of the bears in an instant. They should not wound themselves just because their plans did not work out, as they are still citizens of this kingdom after all. They are all apprehended, 
and Ricky remembers Rishal being on the same team as his sister. Noticing a weak point, Rishal strikes and says that both her brother and his sister were there. They are probably all dead by now, as the bear he sickened on them must have been really hungry after all of the blood he splashed on them. The princess acts decisively and tells Ricky to go and search for them, with Ella trying to follow, but the princess stops her in her tracks. Ella notes that her younger brother is there. She cannot let him die. The princess knows the feeling of hearing that something happened to Precious' family, but she will only get in Ricky's way. If what this boy says is true, the blood of the victims must be everywhere, and there could be 10, perhaps 20 bears in one spot. Ricky is efficient enough to slaughter them, but he cannot do so while protecting her, so she should have faith and wait here patiently. Ella doesn't like it, but she knows that it's true, so she stands still. Ricky eventually finds his sister, laying on the ground with a molar in her arms, but he suddenly stops when he sees a guy wearing a helmet, who is surprised to see him too. Ricky notices his black brooch, making him think that he's part of the commoner regime, but that's when he also notices blood on his sister, so he immediately moves in to attack the final commoner. Before getting hurt, Yurian blocks Ricky's attack with ease, which he notices, and the mysterious figure notes that attempting a surprise attack like this one is a tad too dangerous. Ricky asks if he really thinks he will be let go after he dared to attack his little sister, but he also notices that this mysterious guy imbued his sword with magic, something quite amazing at this age. Yurian doesn't know what he's talking about and asks him to listen calmly, as he is misunderstanding what happened over here. He is not one of the remnants. Before he can even finish his sentence, Ricky summons the power of the wind, which sends a dragon towards the guy that smashes into him and almost breaks his helmet. Ricky finds the time to cast Windshield on his sister and notes all that he has gotten from this fight. Since he is wearing a helmet and his sister is unconscious rather than dead, he believes that he is not a remnant and in recognition of his incredible talent, he will introduce himself. He is Ricky. He humbly serves the wind spirit we and he is also the eldest son of the Viscount family. Yurian says that it's nice to meet him and makes up a fake name, Yuri Shungung. Ricky notes that he said before that he is not a remnant, so he would like to know one thing from him. Who dared to make his sister unconscious like this? Yurian notices how windy it is and remembers that he was the one who did it, so he says as such, but he didn't do anything else. Ricky didn't even hear that last part, as he swears to break his helmet and reveal who he truly is. Yurian didn't expect a misunderstanding to be so hard to resolve, but he doesn't have enough time, as he has to get some molars too. They should talk a bit more the next time they meet. Ricky recognizes that he is fast, to the point that he could defeat a mid-level knight, or even higher, but he has already read where he wants to go, and his sword is much faster than he is. Before the sword can reach Yurian, he disappears instantly, and Ricky tries to do something, but he is suddenly hit in the back of the head, knocking him unconscious. Yurian notes that what he saw was just his afterimage. He didn't believe he would get so fooled by it. After the test is done, every teacher meets in the lounge where a secretary explains about the incident where some examinees attacked others by using the monsters, but the princess swiftly apprehended them and sent the royal investigation team to deal with the aftermath. Magus congratulates everyone for another successful year of tests, with GE noting that the quality of the students is quite high this year, but a man sitting opposite to her named Jerry said that the quality is far from high. This year was a mess, since the commoners and lower class didn't know their place at all. GE tells him to refrain from saying such things as the Royal School of Magic never looked at status. Jerry says otherwise, all of that is on the surface, as this school is a place where one can fulfill all the duties of a noble. Did she not hear from the sage, perhaps? Chi Yi urges him not to talk about her father when they are working. Majus screams at them to stop, which almost breaks his secretary's ear, and asks him to explain the rest of what he wanted. The secretary notes that there are 29 people in total who passed, and among them, there is a top 10. The first person is Princess Saruti, second place is Ricky, Third place is the magic swordsman, Jade. Fourth and fifth place are younger sister Sia and older sister Mu, who look very much alike. Sixth place is Ella, who is very glad to see that she managed to rank so high. Chris, the son of the Minister of Internal Affairs, is seventh, and laments having to stand below a commoner. In eighth place is a guy by the name of Raizo, who wonders why he has to do this dumbass test and swears to kill someone. In ninth place is Hina, the number one fan of the princess and in 10th place is Goliath, who feels that it's better to stay out of Raizo's way, as he seems quite dangerous. Tien also passes in 24th, but when she looks to see what Yurian got, he starts smiling and sweating bullets, as this is extremely bad. He failed the exam. He did get the molar, but perhaps he was too lax with the magic and swordsmanship tests. Ella comes to him and asks how he is first, as she has heard about what happened with his team. She really wanted to come and get him, but she wasn't allowed. Yurian says that he's fine, she shouldn't worry but congratulates her for 6th place, as it's a truly incredible achievement to be in the top 10, 
Ella tells him that she was lucky. She only hopes that she will be lucky again next year. Yurian asks what she means, and Ella explains that she will not enroll this year. They will do it together next year. Their goal was to attend school together, and she won't have anything else. Chris starts laughing in their faces, as he is glad to know that she knows their places, but when he sees that nobody is reacting, he stops, and he laughs even harder, making Yurian wonder if he should just take him out back and make him look at the flowers. Inside the teacher lounge, Ji Yi cannot accept the results of this exam, and she's not talking about the top 10, it's the fact that Yurian did not make the cut. The secretary reads about him, the younger brother of 6th place Ella, while he did bring the lower jaw, he did not do it himself. Ryunbi notes that his swordsmanship is quite lacking compared to his sisters. Perhaps they are unrelated by blood. Chi Yi swears that Yurian has massive talent hidden within him. She saw it personally. After laughing, Chris also does a weird ass dance, making Yurian think that he should break his legs. But someone suddenly arrives and says that he has an announcement to make. One more examinee has been admitted, along with the 29 new students. That person is the magic major Yurian. The nobles are shocked to hear that a commoner was actually specially admitted, and Ella is very glad that he got enrolled, but Yurian wonders what's going on. Before all of this, Ji Yi told everyone that Yurian had enough magic power to make a magical device burst open, but he also limited his strength in that instant, preventing a much bigger accident from occurring. He has amazing control over his abilities. If they let someone like him go, the kingdom will suffer a huge loss. Jerry said that when the monster appeared, it was Tien who sent him flying and rescued him. He lacked the real-world experience required. Ji Yi rebuked this, as this is the very place he shall earn that experience, and in the future, he could become someone that could surpass all of the examinees with enough nurturing. Jerry noted that a commoner like him will never surpass royalty. He is against commoners even enrolling in this prestigious school. Ji Yi stared him down and said that it's him who does not deserve to be here, as he is clearly not prepared to play the role of a teacher and help his students. Ma just screams at them again, making his secretary deaf in one year but said that this magic school is a place to nurture talented people. Like Ji Yi said, status is not the important thing here, and since he trusts her as one of the few heroic magicians in the entire country, he shall allow it. It would be foolish of them to let such talent slip past them. He used his authority as principal, and announced that examinee Yurian would be a special admissions student, majoring in magic. However, if he is not able to produce the results that are expected, he shall be immediately expelled. As Yurian celebrates with Ella, Ricky comes around and notes that the guy he fought with was about this tall too. Yurian looks at him in confusion, but then remembers who he is, and he starts to think that the worst will happen. But Ricky remembers Yurian not being able to cut even half of the dummy, so there's no way that it's him. Ella asks what just happened, but Yurian himself doesn't even know. The next day, while walking to class, Ella notes that the top 10 students and the special admission students are in the advanced class by default. She's also becoming more nervous as they approach. Yurian tells her to relax and act like she always does. When they eventually arrive, they see everyone in their respective seats, doing not much of anything, and Ella wonders where they should sit. Yurian, however, notes that it feels like he's back in elementary school, though now he wonders how the education in this world is. Since this is a more medieval era with magic, it's probably much less developed than his original world. Suddenly, Raizo tells them to get out of their way, which they do, but as he walks to his seat, Chris asks if he just got here. Raizo confirms as much, and Chris starts berating him for showing up later than the commoners. Does he not have any respect for himself as a noble? Raizo asks what his deal is, and Chris tells him that he is rank 8, and he is rank 7. So from now on, he commands him not to be late again. Raizo stares at him, and becomes furious. Did he really think that just because he is ranked higher than him, he is also stronger, and allowed to do this shit? The exam tests are not enough to prove what they can do, but if he wants an example, they should take this outside. Ella notices that they are fighting, and Yurian notes that they should sit far away from those bastards, so they sit somewhere near the middle. Seeing Ella approaching, Jade makes a move and introduces himself, which also prompts her to do the same. He notes that it's amazing for her to be in the advanced class, even though she's a commoner. This is probably the first time something like this has happened, so it's an honor to be in the same class. They should not worry about status, and be casual friends from now on. Yurian notices how hard this guy is trying to please Ella, which is kind of funny. Jade moves on to him and hears that she is her brother, but just before he can finish his sentence, Yurian explains that he is not her biological brother, just so he knows from now on. Jade notes that Ella has amazing swordsmanship, and she is a perfect student, deserving of staying in the advanced class. He is also looking forward to seeing what he can do, since he was also admitted to the advanced class out of nowhere. Yurian notices that he's basically telling him that he's undeserving, so they start fighting each other through their eyes, 
something that the guys below are also doing. After classes are done, Yurian says that there was not much to do on the first day. Since the real classes are supposed to start tomorrow, he is curious about how they will be. Ella notes that finally, they have achieved their dream, so until their other siblings get here, they should enjoy themselves to the fullest. Out of nowhere, a bunch of older students appear, who can't believe that there are commoners in their school. The lanky yellow-haired one wonders if the school has fallen so much in status for them to allow commoners, and the buff guy next to him notes that something like this would have never happened in his time. Standards have truly fallen. Yurian thinks that they must be second students. This seems like the perfect trash mob event that he has been waiting for. Yellow Hair notes that they should greet their seniors properly, which Ella does, but that's when the buff guy tells them to strip, as he won't have commoners wear the same clothes as him. He will be the laughing stock of nobility. He grabs Yurian and tells him to do as he is ordered, but he cannot seem to move Yurian from his feet at all, as he is far too heavy. Suddenly Jade appears and tells the seniors that this is not a place where they should discriminate by status. Yurian is honestly having fun, and Jade continues his approach. He will let those two go, as they are lowering the honor of this school. The seniors have had enough of them, and to prove their superiority, the buff guy smashes his fist into Ella's head, while screaming at them to respect their elders. Seeing Ella fall to the ground, Yurian looks at the two dead fuckers in front of him with disgust, and barely restrains himself from blasting them open. While all of this is happening, the resident hero Hiwan and Majus are having a meeting in his office, where he thanks her for taking the job of teaching the advanced freshman class. She notes that she is doing this out of boredom, since everything is peaceful now. Magus says that she is still the same after all these years. She should cheer up a bit, since this year's class will be the greatest reason in the history of this school since its founding. Hywin wonders what he means at first, but soon realizes that he is talking about those commoner siblings. Despite the nobles opposing his decision, they still entered the advanced class together. She can understand the girl being there, as even for a commoner, she used mana on her sword instinctively. If she had been born a noble, she would have been guaranteed a spot in the top 10, but she doesn't understand why her brother was also selected. Chi Yi told them that he has great talent, but unlike his sister, he has yet to prove himself. Whatever the case, him giving that boy the title of special admissions student has something to do with the meaning he mentioned. Majus answers with a question. Does she think that the current school system is functioning as advertised? This is a place meant for the nurturing of talent regardless of status. But in reality, this place is just a stepping stone for nobles to rise in the world. If this continues as such, the kingdom will inevitably fall. Hywin explains that she only knows how to wield a sword since that's all she's been taught, so she will refer to his better judgment for this situation. Additionally, he might want to rescue his biggest meaning right now, as they are being bullied right outside of the window. Magus says that they should stop them and prepare to go down, but Hywin tells him to stop. They should just watch, as she is also curious about the meaning that he saw within them. The moment Ella was hurt, Yurian moved her away while Jade moved in front of them and told him to get her to the clinic. He will be the one who will drag these two bastards to the student department. Yellow Hair asks how he dares to say something like that, but the buff guy is shaken to his core, as he didn't even see when Yurian disappeared from his grasp. Yurian looks at Ella's injury and notices that it's much more severe, because that fucker infused his fist with mana before he struck. Does he really want to die? The buff guy tries to push Jade back, but he is having difficulties despite his small frame, so he commands Nigel to cast some magic on him which he is scared to do, as they are not allowed to use magic on the school premises. Yurian tells Jade to step aside, who wonders why he is not left for the clinic yet. But Yurian instantly heals her, and notes that they don't need to do such a thing. This shocks everyone, even Ella. But Yurian doesn't see how the others are reacting just yet, so he thinks that it's time for him to show his true powers. That's when he sees Nigel falling to his knees, and the buff guy quivering like chicken. Did he do something wrong? Hywin asks Magus if he let him be the admission student knowing he could do such a thing, but Magus does not answer. Jade's expression turns even worse as he tries to grasp what just happened, but Yurian notes that he just healed her. What's so surprising about it? Since it has come to this, a lesson in this world's common sense is in order. Healing is basically using recovery magic in order to heal wounds, but this process depends on the user's ability and can take anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. The best priest in the world needs at least 5 minutes to complete a healing, so what Yurian just did was cheat healing. Yurian had no idea that the healing wasn't instant for everyone, with Nigel thinking that he wasn't specially admitted for nothing, and the buff guy is mad at him for doing so well as a commoner, while Jade is mad at him because he didn't allow him to look cool in front of Ella. In an instant, Hyowen appears in front of them, and says that fighting on school grounds is prohibited. Yurian felt someone was watching them from a distance. It must have been her. She looks at him and smiles, before telling them to get out of here. As since this is the first day, 
She will pretend that she hasn't seen what happened here. The others thank her, but the buff guy is far from done with them. They eventually arrive at the dorm, where Yurian is excited to see such a comfortable looking bed, but Ella is awfully silent, and he probably knows why. She had no idea he had such talent, as instant healing is something she has never heard of. Yurian fakes a reaction and says that he didn't know it was amazing either. That part is true at least. Ella notes that he will likely get scouted to somewhere incredible once he graduates, and for some reason, it feels like they are slowly drifting apart. Yurian doesn't really know what to say to this, as it's probably true, even if he won't accept leaving her side. Instead of feeling sorry for herself, Ella decides to not give up. He is on her side after all, so they should both grow stronger together. Yurian is glad to see that she has a fighter's spirit, and she agrees. The next day, Hywin introduces herself as the homeroom professor for the advanced class. She hopes that they can get along. They are all surprised to see that the resident hero is their homeroom teacher, with Yurian and Ella recognizing her from yesterday. She notes that they must have enjoyed their soft beds and private rooms, right? All of these benefits are exclusive to the advanced class. The other ordinary students who were unable to get to this level do not have such privileges. So from this day forward, the succulent food they indulge in, the pristine uniforms, and the myriad of amazing facilities, they are able to enjoy all of it only because they are in the advanced class. If they manage to stay in the advanced class until graduation, they will be able to spend their time in school surrounded by envy, but also fame. However, they should not fall complacent, as there is a demotion system reserved only for this class. They all came here thanks to the exam, but if their grades fall short in the future, they will be moved to the ordinary class swiftly. They should keep in mind that the number of students who were in last year's advanced class was zero, so she is curious to see how far they will go. Yurian is excited for all of this, but when he looks at what Hywin is writing on the chalkboard, he becomes confused. He didn't expect such a thing in this world, but this is really perfect for him. In the advanced class, because the excellence class evaluation is absolute instead of graded, the number of students that appear in the advanced class differs each year. Unlike ordinary students, advanced class students receive a lot of support, and a successful career is guaranteed the very moment they graduate. However, if their grades drop, they are immediately demoted, and the honor they gain through their hard work would disappear in an instant. Since the number of people in last year's advanced class was zero, Yurian wonders if he will be able to pass. The thing Hywin wrote on the chalkboard surprises even Chris. It's something truly horrifying, math. Chris is quite confused, so he asks why they need to learn math in a magic school. The two subjects don't seem to click in his head. He would also much rather study magic. Hywin asks why he would like to learn magic, and Chris notes that he wants to become a strong magician like her, and help the kingdom in any way. Hywin likes his answer, but in order to get this strong, he doesn't need mana or magic. What he needs is knowledge of the world. If they hold such knowledge, they will be able to surpass their original abilities very easily. For example, how can she make this flame get bigger? Chris tells her to inject more mana, which is the correct answer, as normally one would inject more mana into a spell to make it more powerful. However, what if they are unable to inject more mana? She asks the princess-obsessed student about it, and she says that they should make other mages support them with their spells. But that is wrong. Even if it would work, there is an efficient way to enlarge it quite a lot. That way is to add a bit of wind, which breathes life into the fire. This is the knowledge she was talking about, and the reason why they should not focus on increasing just their mana. Knowledge is learned, so they should move on with their test and see where to go from there. Eventually the test comes to an end, and Hywin checks the answer sheet, only finding that three people got perfect scores. The first one is Sarudi, which her number one fan adores. The second person is Raizo, and Chris is shocked to hear that this bastard got a perfect score. Raizo notices how much he's sweating and asks if he really failed to get a perfect score after talking so much shit. He is a noble, and always comes to school on time, and seventh during the admission exam. How could he not get a perfect score? The class rank changes within a month. He's not that interested in ranks, but since he started it, it would be wise for him to do better starting tomorrow. As Chris suffers from his own ineptitude, Hyowen reveals the last perfect scorer, Yurian. This surprises everyone, Ella especially, but Yurian is very giddy. In his past life, he was a high school student in the Republic of South Korea. School was hell, so he cannot even attempt to fail such easy questions, since he studied until he fell asleep on the table at many points. Jade now knows how amazing he is, and tells himself that he won't lose no matter what. Since the test has come to an end, Hyowen would like to give everyone a present, which she flies to them using magic. These are advanced class badges to attach to their vests. With them, they will be able to access everything exclusive to the advanced class. Such things as a lavish meal fit for a king, with every kind of meat imaginable. Naturally, Yurian and Ella did this first, 
and are now foaming at the mouth seeing the food in front of them. They go straight into digging in, and since they are promised such meals until graduation, they promise to stay in the advanced class no matter what. After that, the next class starts, with Hyowen asking if they enjoyed the advanced accommodations. She hopes that they did, because this test will impact their grades, unlike the morning test. And worst case scenario, they will be demoted. Since Ella promised something, she is fired up and aims for first place. Hyowen notes that they are still freshmen. Some of them are far too young to hunt monsters by themselves. So in this class, they will have the help of their seniors, who have selflessly volunteered to join this hunting class. The seniors are none other than Nigel and his buff friend, which makes Yurian smile, as they are royally screwed. When Hyowen leaves, Nigel says that it's very pleasant to meet their arrogant little juniors again, and since she said that teamwork is a factor in their score, if they don't do as they please, they will tell on them, and their grades will drop by a lot. However, they should not fret, as they are forgiving, and depending on their actions, they will forget everything that has happened. Jade tells Ella and Yurian that they should really listen to those guys from now on, because he really has to stay in the advanced class, even if this is unfair. Ella says that they must stay too, but Yurian wonders if they will give them a good evaluation, just because they listened well. Just staring at them makes him want to throw up, but he suddenly comes up with a brilliant idea. He goes up to them and says that they should make a bet. Nigel asks how he as a commoner dares to make a bet. What can he even do as a freshman? Yurian says that they will show them what their abilities are. Nigel has had enough of this disrespect and says that he will have his damn bet. He grabs a barrel full of weapons and throws it at their feet. They will take their swords and staffs. As they will have a mock battle, they will acknowledge them only if they win. The buff guy advises them to keep in mind that this is a real sword, so they might get hurt, and the teachers won't know if it was them or a monster who did it. Yurian is surprised that they want them to fight with real weapons, and they will spare them if they win. Nigel confirms it and thinks that they have these kids fully horrified, but they all celebrate in unison and swiftly grab their weapons with glee in their movements, leaving the seniors dumbfounded. Seeing this, Nigel says that they will not hold back at all, which the buff friend agrees with. The fight starts, and the buff guy clashes swords with Ella, but sees that she has infused her sword with mana. How can a lowly commoner do such a thing? Ella thinks that last time she was not able to help herself, let alone Urian, only because she could not stay composed. This time, she will not let her guard down no matter what. The confidence in her face makes the buff guy fearful, and asks Nigel to cast a protection spell on him, which he does, and continues to cast additional supportive spells. Seeing this, Jade rushes behind him and uses an ability to completely cut off Nigel's wand, that ability being a demon sword. Jade retreats his blade, and notes that defeating the magician is the national rule, is it not? Since it has come to this, the buff guy also rushes in for their magician, but Ella moves to intercept. Even with the buff guy charging in closer and closer, Yurian smiles and gives off an aura that completely stops his opponent in his tracks. That is not why he stopped, however, as a large monster has appeared behind Yurian and is preparing to slash him open. Before that can happen, Ella jumps to save him and gets her back slashed, but Yurian is safe. Jade can't just sit idly by and watch this happen, so he uses the second form of demon sword, Helix, to rush in and kill the monster in one blow. The buff senior is shocked to see that the monster was defeated so easily, but that girl still incurred massive damage. She will have to quit. Yurian uses instant healing on her, which fixes her right up, making the buff senior wonder if everyone from the advanced class is like this. He gives up and says that they win. They won't make any unfavorable reports on them, but he will never accept a commoner bastard. Even if his body is amazing, that's only because of a protection spell, so he isn't worth anything and is dragging everyone down with him. Yurian just laughs and says that this is just fine for him. Somewhere in a nearby cabin, Hywin tells the other teachers that this was not supposed to be a joint class. The teachers say that they were also surprised by how suddenly it changed, but they do this pretty often, believe it or not. Hywin wonders if they are allowed to do it during class, but the teachers say that it's fine and better for them, since they won't have to look after the kids. Hywin still finds everything quite suspicious. What was a theory class suddenly transformed into a monster hunting contest, and she also noticed that these two were trying to keep her here and not intervene. She notes that since they have such amazing second years, her students will not get hurt right. The teachers start sweating even more as they hear this, which makes their intentions obvious. Hywin wonders what she should do with these two, since messing with her first students is punishable by death for her. Perhaps complimenting their courage is the right way, but she instead lets off amazing pressure and thinks of waiting things out because, as her students are from the advanced class, they will not fail so easily. Somewhere else, Jade is selected and brought somewhere else by the buff guy who was ordered by someone else, who now asks if the commoner siblings are away, which he confirms. Jade was wondering why he was selected, 
but he didn't expect to meet this bastard. This is Laryl, rank 1 in the second year advanced class. This year's second year group is named the Devil's Den, and the reason for this nickname is a single person, Laryl. On the very first day of last year's entrance ceremony, he told everyone to obey him, which they naturally didn't do, as they still had the pride of a noble. Ten people were in last year's advanced class, but Laryl didn't like insubordination, so he beat everyone to the very brink of death. Three of them were wise enough to surrender and remain in the advanced class. Now there are only four students in the second year advanced class, and there is a trusted hierarchy among them. This is why now Jade is quite scared, seeing everyone from the second class here. Laryl notes that before coming here, he heard some stories about his family, which is crumbling at the seams, so he must have a lot of pressure and expectation resting on his shoulders. If he is unable to graduate from the advanced class, his family will certainly collapse, right? Before coming to the school, Laryl went to his father, who screamed out his frustrations. Why are people who cannot use demonic swords using these mana swords like it is nothing? As magical tools became more and more the norm, like a wand that can easily create water, or a magical sword that spits fire, the demonic sword family slowly began its decline. His father, not knowing what to do, told Laryl that he must graduate from the advanced class no matter what. They must prove that the demonic sword family is thriving, no matter what. If he is unable to graduate from the advanced class, his mother and his siblings who look up to him will all die. Laryl tells him that he will let him graduate from the advanced class, but Jade asks how such a thing would be possible. Laryl explains that the advanced class is being watched by people with power who could do anything they wished, even in this school. Those same people gave him a mission, and they guaranteed graduation from the advanced class if they helped them achieve their objective. For them, such a thing is trivial, so they are very generous with it. What he has to do is something truly simple. He will go to the siblings and do what he is ordered to do. Compared to actually graduating the advanced class with merit, this seems much easier, right? He is helping him only because his family is going through a pretty rough time, so now it's his only chance to become a proper son. When Jade comes back, the siblings ask if he's alright, as they were quite worried because he didn't show any signs of coming back. As Ella approaches, Jade slowly pulls out his sword and aims it directly at the unsuspecting Ella. Before he can do anything, Yurian protects her, but Jade still manages to catch them, making Yurian ask if he's just joking around. Jade advises to be careful, as high voltage electricity is surging through those swords, not even his heel won't be able to do much against them. Yurian says that he is quite impressed by how skilled he is, but Jade apologizes, as he had to do this. The seniors promised him all of the points, and since he must stay in this class no matter what, he couldn't refuse. They are commoners, so it's alright for them to drop out, right? He is going to save them once class ends, he promises, but for the time being they have to stay here. Yurian just looks at him, and wonders what is going on in his mind. When he goes back to Laryl, Jade is punched in the face, as he was ordered to cut off the siblings' limbs and present them, yet he dared to disobey the orders of the higher-ups. What Laryl told him before was the exact same thing, to cut off the limbs of these commoners, as the higher-ups do not like commoners attending such a prestigious school, so their mission is to kill them. Additionally, the other teachers are not able to come to this place, as the higher-ups have pulled some strings to allow this. In other words, they have to complete this mission no matter what, and they have the resources to do it. They must not disappoint these people, and since he has a family that needs saving, he will obey, right? Laryl really doesn't understand him. Why did he do something like this? Does he not wish to graduate from the advanced class? To think that he was merciful to some commoners and threw the chance of his life away. Jade tells him that they are not just commoners, they are Ella and Yurian, and they are humans too. Laryl doesn't get why he's acting in such a way. It has been only a day or two since they became acquainted. Did he perhaps get close to them in that short amount of time? Jade explains that he is not doing this because they are close or some romantic bullshit like that. Ella is extremely talented with the sword. She is worth being in this class. And even if Yurian is weak and doesn't do well in magic, he is incredibly smart and will surely lead the kingdom to prosperity when he becomes of age. His healing is also amazing. In the future, he will be able to heal the sick of the kingdom and be revered as a saint if he so damn well pleases. Both of them have a future that he cannot snuff out. For themselves and for the empire, their futures are brighter than any noble he has met in this place. Laryl considers his words, and notes that everything he said might be true. However, there is nothing left for him or his family, except despair. For interfering with the orders of a high-ranking noble, his family will be brought down even quicker than before. His precious little siblings, who have yet to taste what the real world is like, will be forced to live worthless lives, all because of him. Jade remembers how excited his siblings were that he got into the advanced class, and he was happy that they were so excited for him. However, his siblings asked something which tightened his chest. From now on, 
Their father will be able to smile again, right? Their family will be happy once again, right? Jade remained speechless, but fuked a smile and told them that of course they will. All they have to do is believe in him, as he will not let them down. Laryl tells him that it is not too late. All he needs to do is take his hand. There is nothing evil in prioritizing his family's future. What did his siblings do so wrong to deserve their fates? No matter how much he may resist, those commoner siblings will meet their end one day. There is no one on their side to save them. They are flies to be swatted out. He will give him one final chance to rise to the opportunity and kill them. He harbors no hate for what he did previously, so they should just live their lives as noblemen together. Instead of grabbing it, Jade slaps his arm away, as he will never do something like that. He will find a way to protect both his friends and family, no matter what. Laryl has had enough, and says that he will regret his decision, while Jade is preparing to fight. Even if he doesn't like to admit it, this bastard must be strong, so he has to use his head in order to protect Urien and Ella. Laryl Camel says that he will be stabbing him ten times as punishment and then move on to the siblings. He pulls out a short dagger, and Jade tries to move, but he can't, allowing Laryl a free hit. He notes that he used to use swords before, but now he uses daggers, because he can see the victim better. He throws him to the ground, and one of the second years notes that he's still creeped out by his ability to restrict movement. Another one calls Jade foolish, as he should have obeyed Laryl, because what he does isn't fighting, it's a one-sided beating. Laryl counts down the second to his stab, and Jade swiftly moves off the ground and creates a whip with his ability. But Laryl just blocks in and moves in again after the countdown is over, making it easy for him to stab Jade in the back. He can't lie, he has some great expressions, but it's time to count down again. As he does so, Jade suddenly springs up some spears, which seem to hit Laryl, but one of the second years just laughs, as even if he is talented, he can't do anything. This time Jade is stabbed in the hand, and Laryl starts counting again. Ella is kind of worried for Jade, as what he said seemed to not be true, which Yurian agrees with. She wonders if he will be alright, perhaps those seniors are after him or something, but Yurian isn't worried. If it's just the two they fought, he will be fine. But for some reason, he has a bad feeling about all of this. Jade eventually falls to the ground, making the buff guy squeal in fright. And Laryl tells him to leave if he's going to be such a chicken. They are here to kill after all. He moves on to Jade and asks if he's alive. But it really doesn't matter now since he will go to kill the siblings next. His actions were meaningless, and he brought about the downfall of his family himself. Does he regret what he did? Why is he in such a sorry state? Why is his family going to fall? He is ever so merciful so he will allow him this one chance to go and kill the siblings together. Suddenly Jade says that the movement block duration is 5 seconds and the cooldown is 10 seconds. Laryl is irritated, but knowing about his ability won't change anything. He stabs him again out of anger, and asks why he is not obeying him after all the chances he gave him. Does he not want to graduate from the advanced class and rescue his family? Why is he doing such a thing for some commoners? Jade explains that he would know the answer to all of these questions too, if he had any real friends. He really cannot express how pitiful he looks. His only comrades are the ones he forced into submission. This seems to have hit a nerve, and Laryl moves in for the kill shot, but suddenly something comes and slaps the knife out of his hand before moving Jade away. It was none other than Urien, who told him not to act up like that in the future, while healing him instantly. The second years are surprised to see him use the instant healing, and Urien tells them that they will not get out of here unharmed, especially the one in front of him. He should get prepared for a whopping. This makes Laryl smile and activate his ability. He can't believe that this bastard came to him. How fortunate he is. As he charges in, Urien shows no sign of fear and just smiles. Before Laryl can get to Urien, however, Jade uses the second form of demonic sword and stops him in his tracks, which comes as a surprise. Laryl didn't expect him to get his energy back so soon. Perhaps it was because of this complete instant healing, no? Jade knows what this means and asks Urien why he came here, with how bright he is. He must have deduced that this place is far too dangerous. Urien approaches and says that he was injured gravely. He thought that he got everything, but perhaps it didn't work fully. Jade says that his healing was perfect, which Urien is glad to hear, and says that Ella is safe now. She is with the princess's team. Jade is happy to find out that he didn't cause any harm to her, but Laryl has had enough of them whispering to each other like girls. He's going to get lonely soon. Urien isn't that intimidated, but Jade feels that his mana is filled with killing intent, so he suggests to Urien that he should run away, as this guy is far more dangerous than anticipated. Before Urien can answer, Laryl asks when he gave them permission to leave, and activates his ability, making Jade wonder whose movements he's going to block. Just who is he charging into with that evil face? Jade suddenly creates a shield, before his movement is entirely blocked. This is obvious. He's going to block him so that he has to force Urien into a fight. Laryl is surprised that he actually predicted his move and created a shield in order to protect his little friend. 
but he has had enough of his squirming. He should just stand down like a damn worm. Before he even knows it, Yurian goes behind him and says that if he dares to show his ugly mug in front of him again, he will cut his head off before he even notices. Laryl doesn't get why, but a feeling of immense dread just washed over him as this kid said this. Yurian goes back to Jade to heal him, who wonders why this bastard isn't attacking anymore. He has no idea what he's thinking, but this is their opportunity to end him. Before he can say his plan, Laryl screams out to his guys. As he is fed up with this, they all have ten minutes to kill these bastards. The second years have been desperately waiting for this opportunity. All this waiting has made them itchy. Jade completely forgot that these guys completely existed. He probably could have run away from Laryl, but if they are together, they won't be able to fight, let alone run. Desperation seems to fall on his young mind, but suddenly he gains enough courage to cast away that desperation and think of a way to get out of here and fix what he did like a fool. Yurian tells him that he has done enough and slaps him once over the head, knocking him out in an instant. The others believe that he just collapsed from fear, but Yurian tells him that he should just leave the rest of this to him and have a nice rest. Somewhere else, Ricky says that they are late. Wasn't her brother just going to pick up their teammate, and that's it? Ella finds it strange too, as Yurian promised to return soon. So Saruti notes that they can't just wait around here. Perhaps they should go and find him. It seems like Yurian has fled, and Laryl tells his minions to search every nook and cranny of this forest. They cannot let those rats get away. Suddenly, he meets a strange figure on the road, with one of his minions telling them to step aside, as they have important business to attend to. The mysterious figure says that it's been a while since he got time to exercise, so he will use this chance to stretch his muscles. He just hopes that they don't die quickly. Laryl uses his ability on him and asks who he is one last time, and Yurian tries to introduce himself as such, but stops and says that he's the genius swordsman. Now that he supposedly can't move, the second year minions all charge in at once, and Laryl thinks that this bastard is done for. Zin Kang is the bastard who opposed him the most, and a true symbol of strength, as he can break a wall with his bare hands. Aiyo is the guy who surrendered first, and is a strange bastard who enjoys the act of murder. Kelly is the weakest of this group, but he will complete a mission no matter what it takes. The perfect hunting dog. All of them are amazing underlings for him, and that weird bastard in front of him will die a painful death as these bastards rip him apart. Laryl continues to smile like a dumbass as his three minions are all sent into different trees faces first, something that confuses him deeply. Yurian tells him that his ability won't work on him, so he should stop with the tricks and come fight. Laryl doesn't like when his ability is disrespected, so he uses it again and charges in. But Yurian catches his blade between his fingers and repeats himself. His ability won't work. Is he deaf? Or does he not know how to do anything else but this? Laryl starts to flail his knife around, which Yurian easily blocks. But Laryl screams at him to do something else that's not blocking. Does he really expect to win like that? Yurian responds to the provocation by breaking his little blade in two. If he's ranked first among the second years, he will not be able to exercise at all which is quite disappointing. He really expected more. Seeing his blade broken, Laryl goes for the nuclear option and pulls out a longsword, something he has not used in years. He charges in with great killing intent, and Yurian wonders if he will be able to do more with this. But when he uses his ability, he's quite disappointed. Has he not learned anything? Laryl asks, why does he think that his ability is only about restricting movements? The reason why Laryl is ranked first among the second years is because there is nobody who can keep up with his monstrous speed. Last year what he did was clear assault, but he was not questioned by the magic school for these crimes, and the board of directors announced to everyone why. While he does not possess a perfect character, his accomplishments are to be acknowledged, and in an era where talents like his are few and far between, he is someone who is vital to the success of this kingdom. Laryl asks how he dares to even think that he could ever match his speed. His speed is what gives him the power to do anything. He also praises Yurian for having such a sturdy body, as he was planning to completely cut off his arm but he was only left with a deep wound. How amazing. Yurian doesn't know what he's talking about, but when he notices the blood splat on his shoulder, he says that this is not his blood. Before he even realized it, Laryl had been cut up, and now that he sees it, the pain starts to kick in, so he falls to the ground as he bleeds profusely. He tries to save his life by saying that he's a future prospect of this kingdom. He can't kill him, because he is directly attacking the kingdom. Yurian notes that he should have said that before attempting to murder someone in cold blood. He remembers all that he did to Jade, and gets mad. He will not let him off with just a beating. He will make sure that this meeting of theirs is etched into his eyes and mind. Everyone from Saruti's group feels the dark energy coming from the forest, and Ricky says that it must be Yurison Gong, whom Saruti recognizes as the guy who was the one behind the entrance exam case. Ricky uses wind to fly and get there as fast as possible, and Saruti tells Ella that they should go too. When Ricky arrives at the spot where he felt the aura, he notices Yurisun Gong standing over Laryl, 
and calls out his name. Yurian tells him to just call him Yuris, but Ricky doesn't seem capable of hearing and asks if Laryl, who is the highest ranked second year, was not enough for him, calling him Yurisongong once again. If he really is that good, why isn't he killing the students right off the bat? He feels like he won't tell him, which doesn't matter anymore, because he will beat a confession out of him. Yurian asks if he's stronger than this guy was, and Ricky notes that he has not shown him everything in their last fight. He better be prepared for this time, as he is going to use the power of the Great Wind Spirit. We. Yurian wonders what he's talking about, but he remembers that goddess saying that there are demonic beasts and dragons in this world, so other races do exist besides humanity. Ricky calls forth We to empower him, which she does, and this excites Yurian. Perhaps he should prepare something akin to an awakening too. In an instant, Ricky summons a thousand wind swords, and he sends them all towards Yurian, who finds this quite refreshing, but with a single swing of his sword, he makes all of them fly away. Perhaps it was not as exciting as he thought. Ricky knows that he cannot drag this fight on for long, so when this guy lets his guard down, he must take that chance and end this with one single strike. He charges up even more power, which Yurian likes, and asks him a question. What is the thing that he is currently seeing? The answer is, after image. Yurian moves behind him once again and makes him pass out. This is a trick so nice that it worked twice. Perhaps he will be using it more in the future. With that, the joint senior class of the first years has been cancelled. This was because the suspect in the attack on the nobles before called Eurus appeared again and attacked the students. Hywin barges through the principal's doors and asks if he has received the report. He says that he did. While other teachers were calling for her, he heard about everything. Hywin tells him that they were all holding her back from going to the action. Magus notes that they probably couldn't hold her down if they tried, which Hywin feels is only natural. She stayed put because she wanted to, but she never imagined her students getting hurt. She believes that someone with high authority was behind this, someone who can manipulate the teachers with ease. Magus is glad to hear that they are thinking the same, as only a high-ranking noble could have done something so atrocious. Suddenly, Hyowen slashes the entire room up and says that she hopes he isn't involved in this incident. Magus looks at her and says that this behavior is unsightly, even for someone like her. He is also quite mad that the students got hurt, but he swears that he is not involved. He is in the process of interrogating all of the teachers who held her back, because he believes that they received orders from someone. Soon, they will know who. Hywin says that she will also separately investigate the second-year honor students, who dared to cause harm to her class. They are currently being treated due to the attack, but once they are done recovering, they will be pulled into an investigation. However, this all makes her wonder who Eurus is, perhaps a spy sent by the Empire. Magus says that they can't tell for certain now, but one thing is clear, that he is a dangerous person. Perhaps they are even hiding in this school cleaning his blade of blood at this very moment. Unfortunately for them, Yurian is just eating like a pig, because he has a pretty big appetite, but he thinks that with this, he won't fall behind in the advanced class, which is what he was aiming for. Chris looks at him and says that commoners have absolutely no dinner manners, but Raizo tells him to stop talking, he's just as filthy as they are. Chris has had enough, and says that they should settle this now, which Raizo agrees with. He's already contacted the hospital so he will get admitted in an instant. Hina remembers the commoners saying that they were also attacked, but they seem fine, with Goliath noting that it's because of instant recovery. Mu says that she envies his ability, and her sister wonders what that look in her eyes means. Jade comes to Ella and Yurian, glad to see that they are safe, but Yurian also asks if he's alright. Jade tells him that he's fine, he suddenly collapsed when they were fighting, but there was no harm done to his body, so the doctor let him out early. Suddenly Ella approaches him and says that he sacrificed himself to protect them, which she thanks him for. But from now on he shouldn't do that, as they should overcome things together. They are precious friends after all, are they not? Jade is extremely happy to hear this and promises to do as she just said. But Yurian suddenly breaks the moment by saying that her preciousness ranking is clear. First is him, then the lunch menu, and finally Jade. This makes Jade fired up, and because of these two conflicting groups, the dining hall is getting heated. In this joint class that could have led to demotion, everyone survived, and Yurian is included. A few peaceful months pass and Majus pulls all of the first-year honor students somewhere. He tells Yurian that if he fails this exam, he will be expelled. Originally, while enrolling as a special magic student, there was the condition that he would face expulsion if he got low grades, but he knows that he can pass this exam. With that out of the way, he would like to explain the situation. They are now in the midterms of their class, and this next exam is all about monster hunting. They will enter their respective teams and pass the exam by collecting 20 points. Raizo notes that this sounds like a pain to do, which Magus hears, so he would like to explain further about this exam. Monsters are divided into five grades. Wolf bears and the sort are all level one monsters, 
Swords, bows, axes, and the like are weapon-type monsters, which are level 2. Typhoons, earthquakes, and the sort are natural disaster-type monsters, which are level 3. Diseases and feelings are illness-type monsters, which are level 4. Lastly, there is only one in the world, the unique level 5, which is time. Some of them might have caught on already, but the level of a monster is parallel to how dangerous it is to humans. They do not know why they attack humans, but if something's for certain, it is that they are humanity's enemy. Raizo still doesn't get what that has to do with points, so Magus tells them that level 1s are worth 2 points, and level 2s are worth 5 points. The rest they get themselves. They have to hunt and gather 20 points in a period of 5 days. Additionally, this is an individual competition. They have to prove themselves. Yurian thinks that in order to not reveal his real strength, he has to hunt 4 level 2 monsters worth 5 points, and Sia asks how many points level 3 monsters are worth. Magus notes that she's the third one to ask him that question, and he can tell them that they are worth 20 points. But if they do somehow encounter a level 3 monster, they should run away instantly. Ryunbi comes from behind and says that a level 3 monster is not something that a student can face. They will handle those cases should they pop up. Hywin also says that nobody will interfere this time. Be it monsters or villains, she will personally see to it. Yurian knows what this means, that there will be tons of surveillance on everyone. Will he even be able to get through this exam? Gathering the points is easy, but with so many eyes watching, especially hers, will he be able to do anything? Chris comes to him and notes that this is an individual competition, since he only knows how to heal. Can he even gather 20 points by himself? Ella tells him to not worry, she will help him, which is not much consolation, but he actually prefers it this way. After this, Ryunbi sends every student to their designated locations, while GE calibrates some magical devices to look at the student, which she succeeds in. Majus picks one of these devices up and wonders who will pass first. His secretary believes that it will be the princess, since she has amazing talent for her age. Ryunbi says that Ricky is also quite amazing, since he has the wind spirit helping him. Chi says that all of the first years are amazing this year, though the secretary wonders how the specially admitted commoner will do. Jerry says that the commoner won't do a thing in this test. He will most likely fail and get expelled. Ji Yi says that she won't allow it. She has not seen his instant full recovery in person yet. Hywin notes that whoever passes or not, they will just have to watch, right? Yurian notices the gleaming eye that's above him, and thinks that he will fail if he can't get the points. But how can he pass without his abilities? However, now that he thinks about it, what is the limit of his strength? In this world, instant full recovery is something extremely amazing, yet his heart hasn't burst yet. Perhaps it only applies to his attack power. Suddenly a large rat appears behind him and tries to swallow him whole, but Yurian gets out of the way and uses a magic wand to unleash a ton of water on the rat. Ge is amazed by how perfect that water stream is. He is using the device she made perfectly. Ryunbi also says that his magical power is excellent, but it's his strength that is lacking, as he only just watered down the rat. Yurian did this more as a test, as now he knows that at this level, he feels no pain in his heart. When he did it before, there was an instant pain in his chest that he could not ignore. At that time he was trying to use all of his power, so basically, some amount of power would not cause his heart to burst. Two more rats appear behind him, and they encircle him, but now Yurian is eager to test out the limits of his power. That's when a sword-type monster appears behind the rats, and uses its sharp appendages to cut up the rats before going straight for Yurian. All of the teachers watch eagerly to see what happened, but Yurian clears the dust with his special recovery skill, which Ji Yi loves, and even Jerry is quite impressed by it. Yurian says that this must be a level 2 monster, which makes him wonder about how Ella is doing. She and Jade have grouped up to fight against a level 2, which seems to be an axe type. Jade suggests that they defeat it quickly and find Yurian, because he might be in trouble if they don't. The monster raises his hand and strikes down at them, which Jade manages to block, but it's pushing him back. Ella joins him in pushing it back, and they do manage to erase the attack fully. Jade thanks Ella for the help, as he wouldn't have been able to stop it without her, but she says that it's not a problem they are precious friends after all, though her hand is still numb from that force. A level 2 monster is league stronger than a level 1 monster. If Yurian does take a hit from such a beast, he might not be able to use instant recovery soon enough to save himself. She doesn't give up, however, and says that they should take care of this oversized chopping axe and find Yurian. Jade admires her confidence and takes some of it for himself, now more eager to prove himself than ever. Because of all of this, they think that they will win against this beast, since they can block its attack. But their faces become filled with despair as a new opponent appears, a level 3 hurricane. The blue orbs everyone was watching the students with suddenly split apart, and someone reports that the A2 area, B3, and C1 have level 3 monsters in them. Currently, only 3 have been spotted, but there may be more. 
Magus feels something very strange about this, as this forest is the first grader's designated forest, so only level 1 and 2 monsters should appear, not level 3. He knows that this is unusual, and likely was done with reason, so he tells Ryunbi, Jerry and Hyowen to move in and deal with the level 3s at once. They must protect the students, the future of the kingdom. As the hurricane lets out a loud scream, Ella wonders how they got into this situation, how level 3 got here, and more importantly, what do they do now? Jade suddenly screams at her to focus, as the teachers will be here soon, so all they need to do is not die until then. Ella indeed does become focus, but she still wonders about Yurian and if he's alright. That's when she begins to fly away due to the hurricane, and Jade tells her to grab his hand, which she does. He has hilted himself into the ground with a sword and is now holding the both of them, but he starts to feel a certain presence behind him, and when he looks his eyes shake in fear. He screams at Ella to dodge, and they barely are able to escape the grasp of their next attacker, a level 2 axe. Seeing as how they are sandwiched between monsters, they both get up and rush the axe, as that is the only way they can escape. Jade notices that it's moving into attack, so he creates a shield just in time to defend himself, something that he's very glad that he can do. While the axe is busy with that, Ella rushes in with a swift strike, which almost takes out the axe instantly, but she's not quite at that power level yet. Jade says that it's fine, and Ella notices that he looks more determined than ever. He remembers when his mother asked him if he really wanted to sacrifice his youth in order to protect the family, which he confirmed. If it's for the family, he will not be scared of anything. His mother noticed the worry in her child's eyes, and said that it's not true. He doesn't have to do something as hard as this. He should always use his powers to protect himself, his friends, and the citizens of this kingdom. He does not have to worry about family. That is their role as magic sword wielders after all. He remembers the words of his mother fondly, and thinks that he didn't use everything when fighting Rarel. If he did, his family would have been crushed by the high-ranking nobles. However, if he sent him away, he would lose an asset. Because of that, he thought that it was something he had to sacrifice himself for, so that nobody would suffer. But that's when Yurian came, and even Ella and his siblings are looking out for him. He cannot allow himself to be hurt any longer, so he summons the first form of the magic sword, and cuts the axe completely. Ella is shocked by the amount of power he is exerting, but this seems to have also riled up the tornado, which uses its wind to send them both flying. Ella doesn't know what to do, as she doesn't have any abilities to help with falling, and in the last seconds before the fall, she thinks of Yurian. That's when Yurian appears, and grabs them in place before placing them down, one more gently than the other. Yurian is glad to finally see a level 3, as he was curious about their appearance and power. Jade is very glad to see that he is okay, and explains that the teachers are on the way. All they need to do is wait until then. Yurian knows that this thing is worth 20 points, and notes that they should try to beat it together. Jade can't believe his confidence, as he saw how much power it has. Ella becomes ashamed of her fear, as Yurian is really the bigger person here. That's not really true though, Yurian just wants those sweet and juicy 20 points. Before, Yurian thought about his predicament. He can use a certain amount of power, but what exactly is the limit of this amount? As he was thinking, the eye that was looking at him suddenly started to break, and since nobody was watching, he could deal with the rat that was pestering him. A sword also came to him while nobody was near, but since nobody was watching, he couldn't experiment with the limit. Seeing as how the sword was getting closer, he annihilated it in a second, and stretched, as it's been a long time since he used his power like this. That's when he heard the screams of Ella, and rushed to help. Inside the school, Chi -E desperately tries to repair the orbs, but as she does so, she thinks that the situation is way too strange. Even if some level 3s showed up, something like this shouldn't have happened, and to all of the orbs at once. The repairs are taking unusually long too. Just what is going on in that forest? After Yurian proposed to capture the level 3, the hurricane used a technique to push Jade right into a nearby tree with full force, which makes Ella think that he's hurt, which might have been true if Yurian hadn't healed him instantly, something Jade is very impressed with. He thinks about what Yurian said. He tells them to capture it, not defeat it, and it's something they can actually do. He rushes in with Ella and thinks that they should use everything and face this beast with the purpose of defeating it. If they think about it, escaping from such a beast is nearly impossible. Whatever they might try, the wind would probably send them flying again and again, so focusing all of their determination on one task is the only thing they can do. That's what Yurian meant. That's not what Yurian meant. They really should have just ran away, as they could have nabbed it while they were running, but now he can't really back these guys down, can he? Somewhere near, Ricky prays for strength as he summons a gigantic windsword and drives it straight through the hurricane's chest, killing it instantly. Ricky notes that they sure have knightly spirit to face a level 3 monster with such confidence. Ella is impressed that he killed a level 3 in one shot, and Yurian is mad that his precious 20 points have been stolen, 
Jade feels the same as Urien and asks Ricky why he just went ahead and stole their victory. They could have surely defeated it by themselves. He shouldn't pretend to be cool now. Urien also squats down like a delinquent and notes that he's a petty thief. Those points are theirs. Ricky looks at him and notes that he would happily give them the points, as it's not a waste to invest into the future talents of the kingdom. Last year, he would have ignored the requests of a black brooch student, but a lot of things have happened since then. He tells them that they should prove themselves. If they have similar or the same abilities, he would gladly give them points. He can feel that these freshmen are different. A girl with amazing talent for swordsmanship, a boy who can use instant healing, and he can't forget about Yurisu, who has defeated him twice now. If they have so much talent, he wants to nurture them so that they don't go off the beaten path. Suddenly, a monstrous being appears behind him and asks if he killed the level 3 monster. Everyone can feel its awful presence instantly, and as the monster notes that he doesn't want to die, everyone points their blades at their own necks and slits their own throats. They are only alive because of Yurian, who faces the monster and asks what he is. The monster explains that he has the power to make humans end themselves. He's a level 4 monster. He can call him Gloom, though. Jade starts to vomit on the ground, as he can still feel the cold blade on his neck. Even Ricky is shocked. Did he really slit his own throat? He also notices the scars on the monster's wrists and neck, and Yurian wonders if he's really a level 4. Gloom only now finds it weird that he didn't try to end himself like the others, but Yurian feels like that's not a normal thing to ask someone he just met. Gloom says that it is. People ending themselves in his presence is the most natural thing there is. Yurian can't believe this guy, but that's when Ricky grabs his shoulder and says that he has confirmed his ability. Complete instant healing is real, and since this ability can revolutionize the way they use healing magic, he must protect this student at all costs, for the kingdom. He summons the power of wind to aid him in this battle, and Gloom didn't expect for him to be under a great spirit. Ricky tells him not to dare mention her with that ugly mouth of his. He thinks that this monster can speak, and since it's also intelligent, this is surely a level 4. Gloom feels insulted that a mere spirit minion would dare to face him, and rushes in once again, making everyone hilt their blades and shed their own blood. Yurian tells him to stop what he's doing, and he heals everyone. Gloom thought that at first it was a coincidence that these children didn't die, or perhaps a miracle, but now he can see that it was because of him. It seems that he has gained a new objective, to kill a future prospect of the Empire, who will definitely interfere with their plans. Ricky refuses to let him touch Yurian, as besides the healing, he has amazing magic tolerance, to not be affected by the monster. Unfortunately for Ricky, Gloom is already above Yurian, and is ready to twist his neck open. But that's when Jade uses the first form of demonic sword to slightly graze Gloom. He knows that this is not enough, and Gloom still moves on to grab Yurian, so Ricky uses his wind to send all of them flying. Yurian feels that this situation is a bit familiar, just like when Tien blew him away with her powers. Perhaps these guys are siblings, since they sure look the same. Gloom is slightly annoyed by this, and asks if this is the limit of his abilities. Why didn't he also run away with them? Ricky notes that there's no need for him to run away. He will buy enough time for the warrior that is here to show up. Gloom understands. He's trying to buy time to join that warrior, but he should look at himself. He's one second away from pissing his pants. Ricky feels that he has to hold him for at least three seconds and summons a wind dragon to rush at Gloom, who just completely tanks the attack. He should know that he is not directly attacked yet. Ricky can feel his demise coming and prepares for the pain, but that's when Ryunbi appears, noting that he came here to deal with a level three, but there seem to be bigger problems around here. Why is a level 4 monster here? Gloom feels like there's no use answering someone who is already dead, and Ryunbi uses the power of the wind to boost himself. Yurian watches the unconscious Ella and Jade while in the air, wondering what to do in this situation. As soon as Ryunbi activates his ability, a pair of butterfly wings appear behind him, and he almost breaks the sound barrier as he charges into the monster. The boom of the speed he's exerting can be heard even at the school, and Ma just knows that something strange is going on. Chi Yi is still trying her best but something is seriously wrong. No matter how many level 3 monsters are in the forest, it's impossible for the magical tools to be destroyed at once, and they aren't even repairable. There is something interfering with their communications. A much stronger enemy must have appeared. Magus starts to connect the dots and immediately contacts Hyoin, but he isn't reaching her. The sudden appearance of the level 3 monsters, the instant destruction of all communication devices, and the interference, this is not a coincidence. Another monster has appeared. A level 4. But why during these exams? Perhaps this is directed at the princess? Whatever the case, that monster will regret underestimating this school and its staff. He tells GE that until the knights arrive, he will go down and protect the students too. Now he can only hope that Ryunbi endures whatever he is up against. Gloom laughs, as he must think that they are on equal footing just because of this. 
What a fool he is. He will know his place. Ryunbi instantly dodges his attack and summons a wind sword which he tries to impale Gloom with, but he uses another of his hands to try and grab him. He seems to have succeeded, but that was only Ryunbi's after image, as he's actually behind Gloom preparing yet another attack, something that Gloom tries to retaliate against, but Ryunbi dodges him again. He is far too slow, even for a level 4. Ricky is shocked to see such amazing speed coming from him, but it's to be expected. If anyone can defeat a level 4, it has to be him. As he rushes the blade to Gloom's neck, Gloom activates his ability once again, making Ryunbi instantly stab himself in the leg, something he subconsciously does without thinking about it. It seems that this monster's power is to make people hurt themselves. Gloom asks where his arrogance went. Has he lost it after realizing there's no way for him to win? Ryunbi felt a song instantly as this guy activated his ability. A song of overwhelming despair, of helplessness. He bites his own lip to bring himself back to reality, and asks Gloom about his purpose. Why did an inactive level 4 suddenly appear here? Gloom laughs. It's very funny to see him try to gather as much information as possible before his demise, like he could do something with it after death. He will tell him, however, that their purpose is to eradicate humanity. Ricky screams at Ryunbi that they have to escape. What he did should buy them enough time for that. Ryunbi agrees. He must think wisely here. He didn't come to kill a level 4. No student has died up until now, so they should return and report the appearance of a level 4. Suddenly Gloom completely overpowers the both of them by strangling them with an ability. He never gets tired of seeing such beauty. They are the only species to die so elegantly. However, he's not here to play, so he will dispose of them at once. Tien suddenly thinks of her brother, a thought of worry for him. Before Gloom could annihilate them, something appeared in front of him, a six-winged being, the great spirit of wind, We. She asks if they are friends or something since he didn't use honorifics, and teaches him a lesson by taking one of his arms clean off. Gloom knows that he's in danger, as among the four great spirits, We is the most selfish and mad. He apologizes for being so rude, he truly lacked the respect she deserves, but the great spirits are not supposed to interfere in other ecosystems, so what is she doing now? The beings that protect and manage the nature and order of this world are the four great spirits, and one of them is the great spirit of wind, We. She explains that she's here to negotiate. She doesn't want the two behind her to die. In exchange, she will not interfere, even if he kills other humans. He didn't come to kill these two anyway, right? Gloom certainly didn't expect a great spirit to come and negotiate with him. But why does she want to keep these two? Because they are handsome. We notes that it's as he says. They are both good looking, and she likes things like that, meaning that she also hates him. Gloom still doesn't understand her, as spirits aren't supposed to interfere with other ecosystems no matter what, right? She asks where he heard such a thing. Must be a bad rumor, but he should decide quickly. She's quite reserved with her time. Gloom doesn't know if this is an offer or a threat. However, his objective doesn't align with fighting the spirit and killing those two, so he should accept. At the same time, if they are so cherished by her, enough to make her appear, then in the future, they will be able to borrow a ton of power from her. It would be much better for him to fight against her now and kill them while they are still weak. We is surprised that he actually decided to fight, and with a single flick of her finger, she rips him in half. Since he clearly doesn't know how to negotiate, he should receive his punishment, which is to die four times. She bashes him again and again, Gloom unable to do anything against her. He should have understood that she was only negotiating because she's a great spirit. She can do much more than this, make him disappear completely if he pushes her further. Gloom recovers from his blob form and angrily says that they will negotiate, since he also has an objective he must fulfill. She should know, though, that he's making concessions for his objective. Wee tells him to get out of here while he still can, and after leaving she wonders if it's time for these bastards to move again, which hasn't happened in a while. She immediately forgets about that and jumps on Ricky's face, glad to see him in person. She tries to wake him up, but to no avail. She's just glad that he is safe. She also sees Ryunbi passed out next to him, and notices that he still refuses to use her power. After Gloom gets far enough away, he lets his energy fly everywhere out of sheer anger. He cannot waste more time. He should go and fulfill his purpose of being here. First though, he would like to trample these little seedlings, until what he's feeling disappears. Nobody will get out alive. In an instant, someone drops down behind him with great power. That someone being Yurian, who is mad at himself that he hesitated. Even when Ella was hurt, he could not find a way to solve this situation without revealing his powers. Gloom is surprised that he didn't run away. But that would have been useless anyway, as everyone around here will die, and their hope will vanish. He will turn it into fear and despair. He suddenly starts to strangle Yurian, and notes that the hands of someone trying to harm themselves are much more desperate than anyone else's. Yurian has had enough. He grabs his hand and pulls it off. He is always acting like he could make others do anything, but he should stop bullshitting. 
He cannot do anything. He's nothing. This makes Gloom madder than before, and he summons a dozen hands to retaliate. Urien thinks of what he saw today. He gauged his power correctly. So from now on, he will not hesitate anymore. He summons his might into one fist and completely annihilates Gloom and everything around him. Thank you for watching. See you next time.